You know, there are many mysteries in life, many unexplained events, and many cases of what could be lost knowledge. These are some of the topics that literally define our little podcast here of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Albeit, not all of our topics might be considered nightmarish, they still have enough mystique, almost a magical quality about them that pauses us to stop and think. What did our ancestors possibly know that, for whatever reason, may not have been passed down entirely? Do some people possess special gifts, or do we all have it, if we choose to look? Tonight, we're going to be focusing on one of these topics, remote viewing, where the belief is you can project your consciousness to a location to see and hear things that otherwise, well, simply put, we would never know about or be allowed to see or hear. Is it real? Well, multiple world governments believe that it is because they've spent millions and millions of dollars in researching it independently and guard it like in a vault. It's even been used, some would say, to help win the wars. Join us tonight as we delve deep into the aspects and belief of remote viewing. Who knows? Maybe you can do it too. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded, we become fearful to be deceived. Still, we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller, conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. I begin a lot of episodes this way. Before we get too deep into this. Before we get too deep. I've been fascinated with psychic abilities, and I believe there's a book in my library currently about how to uh, astral project, mm. which never managed to master. I'm, that is always intriguing, especially am, it intrigues my wife. I am unfortunately stuck in this physical form. <laughs> so. Not for lack of trying, though. Now, I had friends in high school who believed that they were capable of doing it. Uh, at least on like a dream level, like you could do it when you were asleep, when you were dreaming, which a lot of people say that that, that kind of happened. I can say I've had a little bit of that, uh, especially as a younger child dreaming. But uh, psychic abilities fascinate me. And as we get into this, you know, I, I'm going to kind of focus on Project Stargate, which is a government thing. We'll, we'll get into that more. But the reason that I latched onto that one so much is there's a series of books. And I don't remember when they started being published. I want to say the 80s. It may have been just before called the Necroscope series. And it all started because the author, Brian Lumley, who unfortunately, I think he passed sometime last year, if I remember correctly, his father had passed away and he wanted to know what would the dead tell you if you could talk to him again? Because he wanted to talk to his dad, you know, you have that sense of loss. And so he starts writing this book about a, a guy who has the ability to communicate with the dead. And in the process of writing that book, he created this world. There's I think 16 novels in the series. Oh, wow. And you're talking 500 page or more for each novel. Chunky novels. He built this world where essentially every government in the world has a secret division of its intelligence organization totally dedicated to using psychic spies, people with mental psychic abilities. And so the Project Stargate, for me to find out that we really had projects like that <laughs> and that other governments have similar projects was, was awesome to me. This is a series of novels where I've read, I've read almost everything available with the exception of a couple of short story collections, which are hard to find. They even made a short-lived role-playing game that has like maybe six books. It was out of print before I ever learned it existed, and I still have every one of those books. <laughs> I tracked them down individually and bought them. So again, psychic abilities are fascinating, and I think as we, we get into this, you know, Eric and I, you know, we always like to put in personal anecdotes, definitely towards the end with my question that I have. You know, I think we'll we'll touch on maybe, you know, if we have any personal experiences with this kind of thing. But but yeah, the 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 untapped potential of the human mind is is a fascinating thing to me. I want to kind of start off uh, the difference between two very similar terms and Bill's already actually kind of bridged this for me because in doing research and I will say before I really did research, I I kind of struggled with a little bit of this, the difference between these two terms. Remote viewing 
is the practice of seeking impressions about a distant or unseen subject. You're trying to sense with the mind. Typically, remote viewing is expected to give you information about an object, an event, a person, location that is hidden from physical view and separated by at least some distance. Another similar term you might be familiar with, and Bill mentioned it, is astral projection. While remote viewing, or uh, you know, could be called you know RV, and astral projection have been uh, have many similarities. They have some fundamental differences that, however, both can be used to accomplish many of the same results. Remote viewing can be done while you're awake or while you're asleep, but it is on the physical or earth plane. But because you're in that material or earth plane, you project your consciousness to a particular location. That could even be longitude, latitude. It could be something a little bit vaguer, like a mountain, the tallest mountain peak in a region. Well, so sometimes those impressions would even be like, well, there's a big tall tree and it's by a river. Right. You know, they might not be able to give you the exact location, but, but I talk about some cases where even they were able to give like, they handed a young lady a map and she pointed to like right there. Right there. Yes. Yes. So there's a, there's a designation at least to some degree that you hone in on and the issue, I won't say the problem, the issue when you're doing remote viewing is you kind of have the stipulation sometimes of those physical walls. If you project yourself into, let's say, a locked office, there's no way out, maybe guards are outside, whatever, you can't like walk through a window or can't walk through the wall. You would have to pull yourself, your conscious back out of that locked office to go to another designation. Astral projection is done exclusively once the body enters into like REM sleep, a deep sleep. And astral projection is on a much higher level, a much higher plane, the astral plane. So you don't have the limitations of those physical confinements. I guess it's easier to say you're almost like a ghost. You could, in astral projection, you can walk through walls, doors, even pass through floors, roofs. Find your target, move around freely without having to like cast yourself, pull yourself back, cast yourself. But again, once you're there, the two are very similar. You hear things, you see things, you observe things, but there is that finite little difference. Now, still, it is well believed that anyone can be taught either of these skills. It's not something, at least to most people's belief, that you have to be born with. It's not like a gift or a curse. It's just something that exists in all of us waiting to be tapped into. And like any craft or art, it's something that you have to learn. And the more you use it, the better you utilize it over trial and time. Bill had even mentioned he had a book on it and sounded like you had at least at one point in time attempted. Yeah, I read through it and I've, I've tried a couple of different, you know, things to, to hone any kind of potential. I don't, I don't think that I, I've never untapped that potential. I've never, 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 had never that tapped luck. that potential. But again, maybe you've only tried a couple of times. You know, maybe if you really convinced yourself, I'm going to do this and I'm going to practice every day for the next three months, you know, maybe something, a different outcourse would take place. But the belief is all of us have the ability and some of our ancestors really honed in on this and, and was really good at this. And some people even today are believed to be able to do this. And it's some of those type stories that I think we're going to kind of share and, and get a bit more gleaming into. Kind of an introduction. During the Cold War years, the U.S. and Soviet Union are known to have been spying on each other using uh, services of psychic remote viewing with specific objectives of gathering intelligence, gathering intelligence information of military significance. In simple terms, remote viewing is the ability of that human participant to acquire information about these exclusive, top, covert, private things, remote geographical targets, otherwise inaccessible by any known sensory means. Or there were two uh, complementary components to the U.S. remote viewing program. First part, the research program Anomalous Cognition, or AC, directed initially by the physicist uh, Hall Puthoff, and Russell Targ 
at the laboratories of Stanford Research International at Millo Park in California. Now, that was shifted in 1988 to the Science Applications International Corporation under the direction of Edwin May. The findings of their early studies have been reported in very prestigious, well-known, well-trusted scientific journals, especially during the mid to late 1970s. Now, the second part, there were mission-oriented operational assignments that were overseen by various intelligence agencies of the U.S. government, and that is Stargate. And I'm not going to pull a lot of that because I know Bill's done a lot of research on that. We got a lot on Stargate. But a little background and history on remote viewing as general. The, the faculty of remote viewing is popularly known as extrasensory perception, or ESP for short. It's a term coined by pioneering researcher J.B. Rhine back in 1934. And they were students of Indian lore. And however, they felt that they were well acquainted with it because of those almost religious beliefs, the practice, the discipline. The techniques used by the U.S. viewers for looking into the distance and the future are strikingly similar of the detailed instructions given by the Yoga Sutra. Now, most ancient civilizations appear to have been at least acquainted with the knowledge of the particular facility of the human mind. In both Indian and Chinese scriptures, there are instances of the clairvoyant skills that people are using as a tool for obtaining relevant military information on the battleground. Now, it is learned that the U.S. government authorities started paying serious attention to investigating the possibilities of this application, this remote viewing technique, for military purposes only when a book titled Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain appeared. Now, that was published in 1970. The book appears to have jolted kind of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency otherwise known as the CIA, into an action, triggering what one journalist has dubbed the race for inner space. Hal Puthoff, the founder of the first director of the SRI studies, has given a graphic account of how it all began and his recollections of the program. Laboratory Investigations on Remote Viewing Systematic science investigations of telepathy and ESP have been carried out in the U.S., J.B. Ryan and his associates, all the way back during the 1930s and the 1940s at Duke's University, using a set of what is called Zinner cards. Now, these contain symbols such as squares, circles, stars, a plus sign, wavy patterns that kind of look like waves. One of these cards selected at random would be kept open in a room, and a transmitting agent would focus his mental attention and concentration on the same, a, a reviewer, a viewer is sitting adjacent in the room would try to guess which card is open. If you've ever seen Ghostbusters, it's in Ghostbusters. Yes. And I have that in here. I absolutely <laughs> love it. And it's a beautiful representation of the Zinner cards. Most of you are going to be familiar with that. In the original Ghostbusters movie, 1984, I think it was, the humorous scene of Dr. Peter Vinkman, played by, of course, Bill Murray, has his two test subjects hooked up to electroshock while I will use the word playing a game because Dr. Vickman is playing a game with them. Yeah. Every, every time the woman guesses and she's an attractive woman, Jennifer, he, he tells her she got it right. Regardless, regardless, every time the guy guesses, he tells him he got it wrong and shocks. Him. And then the guy on, on one occasion, he actually guesses what the card is. You're yeah. seeing it. And he goes, Oh no, no. So close, <laughs> but no, you're wrong. And then gives him an electronic shock. And the best part is, Poor guy's been shocked like three or four times. And then finally he gets that last jolt and he spits his gum out across the room. It is so funny. And then he's going back and forth with Jennifer, the, the attractive blonde. And, you know, Dr. Vickman, of course, is playing his character. You can't see this, can you? Really? Seriously, you've gotten every one of these right. And the poor nerdy guy sitting across her, he's like trying to figure out what's going on. He's looking back and forth to the right and the left. Anyhow, that is the definition of the Zinner cards. That is exactly what we're talking about. But the government actually did use these for part of their studies in the laboratory. Now, unfortunately, to obtain statistical significant results, the experiment had to be repeated thousands of times. And this led to a decline effects, basically due to boredom, tiredness on the, on the part of the remote viewer to overcome this problem. 
the psychologists and researchers at SRI started using a set of pictures taken from the National Geographic magazines instead of these Zinner cards. And a rank order mentioned of quantifying the success rate was developed from this. So good old National Geographic kind of comes in and plays a part here. Now, in the next stage of the research, simulating military spying missions, the presence of transmitting an agent at the target site was dispensed with the remote viewer, and it was encouraged to view relevant military targets within the U.S., given only the latitude and longitude of the target site. A brief summary of the outcome on the research basically was, was recorded, sponsored by the U.S. government, and is available at Edwin May's website, uh, which is www.lfr.org. Dr. May was the director of this research at SAIC when the program was officially terminated in 1995. Well, like Eric talked about, at the height of the Cold War, you know, the U.S. and the Soviets, you know, the bad guys, we were spying on each other, trying to find out what the other had and up their sleeve and, and what they were trying to do to get ahead of the other you know, side. And in 1970, U.S. intelligence sources came to believe that the Soviet Union was spending 60 million rubles a year on psychic research. And, you know, if the Russians are going to do it, well, we need to get involved, too. And, of course, at this point in time, you know, new age thinking had started to, to advance. And, you know, the, the attitudes of the 60s, you know, we became more open to those kinds of things. And so this created renewed interest into the psychic phenomenon and made it easier to give financial support for research into such things. So in response to believing that the Soviet Union was spending 60 million rubles, you know, the U.S. government, in turn, starts spending money on psychic research itself. Can't let the Russians get ahead of us. Yeah, and, and of course, both, you know, and, and they believe that remote viewing would be an invaluable tool in the intelligence war. And so they began conducting efforts, various intelligence agencies, under the umbrella of the United States government to investigate, research, develop psychic counterintelligence, if you will. Now, these fell under a variety of names over, over the years. Gondola Wish, Grill Flame, Center Lane, Sunstreak, Scanate. These would all eventually be rolled together in 1991, and the overall project was Project Stargate. So I'm going to refer to it as Project Stargate, you know, even before 1991, because really it's just a much cooler name and it sort of encompasses <laughs> everything. But the secretive project was started by the CIA in 1972 with the goal of investigating the potential for psychic phenomenon in military and domestic intelligence applications. The whole project was overseen until 1987 by Lieutenant Frederick Holmes Skip Atwater, an aide and what was called, quote, a psychic headhunter uh, named Major General Albert Stubblebine. That is a cool job title. Stubblebine. Well. I, I like I, the I was, name. I was talking about the, the yeah, psychic headhunter. I want that job. Psychic headhunter. Of course, they're work primarily involved remote viewing, but they did include research into other areas, other psychic abilities, really anything to give them an edge up, anything they could use. Some of the research that fell under the umbrella of Project Stargate uh, took place at the Stanford Research Institute, like Eric said, with physicist Russell Targ and, and Harold Puthoff. Their research kind of fell underneath this umbrella of Stargate. And they began, of course, testing what they considered individuals that were gifted and psychics. Uh, one of the best known test subjects they had in their first phase of testing was celebrity psychic Yuri Geller. That's a name that comes up in psy psychic circles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is kind of a hard to say phrase. But, you know, he, uh, he was known for his ability to bend spoons with the power of his mind, which was later, I believe, proven to be uh, a hoax. Now, after a series of tests, the CIA concluded that Geller did in fact possess psychic abilities. And after these initial promising tests, University of Oregon psychology professor Ray Hyman was brought in and they asked him to go to SRI to evaluate Geller for himself. After spending time with Geller, Hyman concluded that Geller was a fraud. So, again, Geller, you know, I, I think it's been kind of proved that he really wasn't bending spoons with his mind, unfortunately. I remember seeing some of those uh, videos and stuff, though. It was pretty convincing at the time. It but was... I believe there was an element of misdirection, yes. like any stage magician. Yeah, so it was a magician's trick. In the late 70s, the CIA shut down its work with ESP in California and moved the whole project to U.S. Army Fort Meade in Maryland. Now, in, in Fort Meade, it was a small-scale unit. They, uh, they said there was only 15 to 20 individuals operating out of what was described as, quote, a leaky old wooden barracks. <laughs> so already by this time, they weren't pouring the most money into yeah. it. Although I think it said that it was like a $20 million project 
a year, maybe, by the time it was concluded. So that's a lot of money. With a leaky roof. Yeah. In 1979, during a discussion about remote viewing in the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Representative Charles Rose said that the project, quote, seemed like a hell of a cheap radar system. And if the Russians have it and we don't, we're in serious trouble. So, you know, they had support from, from the government, higher levels of the government, to fund this research. In the 80s, the project became affiliated with the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, which used the program to, quote, collect intelligence against foreign targets using laboratory studies to find new ways to improve remote viewing for the use of the intelligence world and the analysis of foreign activities to develop or exploit the paranormal for any uses which might affect our national security. Now, there's one word that really leapt out to me in that. The paranormal. Normal. Yeah. That implies that we're looking at more than just psychic power, to me. Yes. All I could think of was the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Development, or Defense, I think it is, from Hellboy. <laughs> but I would love for that to be like a real branch of the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I complain about where my tax dollar is going, but if we're funding Hellboy, <laughs> I'm on board. It's easier a pill to swallow. Though. Yeah. In the early 90s, the Military Intelligence Board appointed Army Colonel William Johnson to manage the remote viewing unit and evaluate its usefulness. Funding dissipated in late 94, and the program went into decline. The project was transferred out of DIA hands back to the CIA in 95, at which point the CIA partly declassified the project. They also hired the American Institute for Research to perform a historical evaluation of the results generated by the Stargate project. Some of those within the program believe that they had had success, but also noted the limits of those successes, suggesting that remote viewers needed to work in conjunction with more mundane information collecting efforts. And some reviewers maintained that there had been a statistically significant positive effect with some subjects scoring five to 15% above just random chance. So they were, they seemed to be hitting on, on the things they were supposed to be looking for. The CIA terminated the project in 1995 based on the findings of the review conducted, but time magazine stated even in 1995 that they kept three full-time psychics, working at Fort Meade on a budget of 500000 a year. So that project may not have been concluded. May not be dead yet. Well, let's get into just some examples of documented trials that we're going to call successful. And I'm actually getting part of mine from this Dr. May that I had mentioned, the director of the research uh, at SAIC. Uh, and it was up to the point when the they say the program was terminated in 1995. So it'll be 1995 and prior. So even though a lot of people said Stargate was a failure, I have here a list of successes from Star the Stargate project over the years. And uh, Eric may be able to supplement some of this. And then I think some of his are outside of the Stargate, but they may be part of Stargate too. I'm well, sure. because they were condensed later on. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff fell under Stargate. A, a good example is when the launch date of a newly built Soviet typhoon submarine was predicted months before it actually happened by Joseph McMonagall, former army warrant officer who was selected to participate in Project Stargate. He predicted the sub would be launched sometime in the month of January 1981, and satellite photos confirmed mid-January that the submarine had in fact been launched. Another time, McMonagall was able to help identify the location of the kidnapped American General James Dozier with no information other than his name, which seems pretty accurate. McMonagall established himself as the best psychic in the program and the entire world and quickly became known as remote viewer number one. He was not only considered the headline of the Stargate project, but also the clearest evidence of psychic phenomenon to the CIA. He worked with Project Stargate from 1978 to 1984 in nearly 450 missions, specializing in near-death experiences, out-of-body travel, and UFOs, including on one occasion helping, to, helping CIA agents find a shortwave radio concealed in the pocket calculator of a suspected KGB agent captured in South Africa. That's pretty precise. That's pretty precise. Now, one of the most bizarre experiments he was involved in was his 1984 trip to Mars. He was presented with an envelope, which is usually how this process worked. You were given an envelope, which you did not open. It was sealed. Now, on a paper inside the envelope was written the planet Mars and the time frame of 1 million BC. A lot of the times, these guys didn't even have those prompts. They didn't know what they were supposed to look at. They were given a sealed envelope. The information was in it. They never looked at it. McMonagall, of course, not knowing what was in the envelope, reported seeing very large, thin people wearing strange clothes, obelisks, pyramids. And then after finding out the contents of the envelope, he believed that he had in fact, so after finding out the contents of the envelope, he believed that he had in fact beheld Mars in the distant past. As Bill had said, this Joe McMonagall is kind of the top 
gold star of the program. And one of the documented trials that I found online under this Dr. May was just another example of where he was proving himself. And again, it basically it states the primary target was an electron accelerator at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, or LLNL. The Q was supplied a name and a social security number of an intelligence officer, which was, of course, the target person, unknown to the remote viewer or others stationed at the SRI lab. The assignment? Describe the target's personal movements and ambience of his surroundings at eight-hour intervals during the span of the next 24 hours. So again, this is pretty weird, pretty precise. I want to know where this person is, what they are hearing, what they are seeing. Every eight hours, I want you to give me a report over a span of the next 24 hours. Now, the target person's actual movements, besides moving within that, that site, The target person also visited a windmill farm just outside of the LLNL site at approximately 4 p.m. Again, pretty precise details. The results said they were a fuzzy set of analysis of the various descriptions provided by the receiver showed that the overall accuracy of the remote was 77% and overall reliable 78% of the time. The reliability of the description of the windmill farm was 100% accurate as defined, the best you could possibly be. Again, so he is describing, you know, yeah, he walked around this office, he did this hallway, he heard this alarm go off, different details, but then he, he made a note that said, now he left the premise, he left work, he left the lab at 4 p.m. and went to go visit this giant windmill site uh, just down the road. And what he described of that windmill site then was 100% accurate with all the details and intelligence that they could gather. They thought this was interesting that the individual that was targeted left the job and he, he made a point that he caught that. But then some also argued, well, of course that would be at 100% because that's not within the restricted lab. So in theory, McGonagall could have visited himself or known somebody who had went to that windmill site. So that that was just another example in some of the arguments that can come back and forth. Now I have another story. The swimming pool complex at uh, Palo Alto, this was in 1974. This viewing was carried out by Pat Price, who was described by Russell Targ as one of their psychic treasures. The target was selected randomly from an out of this target pool of sites unknown to Pat Price and Russell Targ, who were stationed inside the Faraday cage. Now, in the Radio Physics Building, the SRI International Labs, Hall Putnoff and his associate Bart drove off to the target site, which was about five miles away. After the allotted time of 30 minutes, Pat Price was asked to view and describe the target site that Hal Putoff and his associate Bart would then be physically at and almost like seeing through their eyes. Now, Pat said they saw a circular pool of water about 100 feet in diameter. It was 110 measures. We're getting pretty close. He saw a rectangle pool 60 foot by 80 foot. It was actually 75 by 100. Again, pretty close. He went on to describe a concrete block house that was also at the site. And he even drew a diagram of the complex and how the building and how the pools laid out because in a a rude, crude map. Pat said that the site seemed to be a water purification plant and drew two water storage tanks on some type of a rotary or rotating machine uh, with pumps. Now, after completing the drawing and the description, all of them drove to the site to assess the accuracy of Pat's viewing, including Pat. Everything was remarkably accurate except for the two water tanks and the water purification plant, which were absent. Now, Pat Price's inclusion of the non-existent tanks remained a puzzle for 21 years. However, the mystery was unexpectedly solved in March of 1995 when, as part of the centennial celebrations of the city of Palo Alto, a commemorative volume was published. This brochure carried a picture of the Rincona Park site that was taken in 1913 on the occasion of the inauguration of the city's new waterworks, showing indeed 
two water tanks, exactly in the location indicated by Pat Price in the 1974 viewing that he drew on the map. This amazing example brings out some of the remarkable features of remote viewing, namely the ability of consciousness to access not only the present, but the past, how they might kind of coexist, overlap when you're doing remote viewing. The remote viewer literature is referred to as retrocognitive. It's an ancient Indian text. Uh, Basically, it describes accessing this in their beliefs as well, stating that, again, it was like multiple time frames overlapped. And by doing this remote viewing, you would be able to see past, present, and possibly even future. So another one of Stargate's successes, three weeks before a hostage release in the Middle East. The release was predicted, as well as an accurate description of the medical condition of the hostage, which would, would be released upon his recovery. It was predicted by Keith Hooray, who said, He seems to be suffering from nausea. One side of his body seems damaged or hurt. He will be on an airplane in the next few days. This hostage turned out to be Richard Queen, who was held by Iranian militants and was now very ill with numerous symptoms, including muscle weakness, lack of coordination, difficulty in vision, spasticity, vertigo, facial numbness, tremor, and multiple sclerosis that affected nerves on one side of his body. So, I mean, he he noted that one side of this guy was not going to be fully functional, and that's what it turned out to be. Third story that I'll share is the discovery of the rings around the planet Jupiter. I will probably butcher this name, but Ingo Swano, the famous psychic who was in fact responsible for getting Hal Putoff and his colleagues at SRA Labs interested in investigating the boundaries between animate and inanimate objects. This was about 1972. Now, he suggested carrying out an experiment to remote view the planet Jupiter just to kind of prove to the fact that, hey, not only does this work on Earth, but we are able to remote view things in space, things in other, there's no boundaries, essentially. So they decided to go ahead and do this study to help try to prove or disprove this and to view the planet Jupiter before the upcoming NASA Pioneer 10 did a flyby, much to the uh, thrill intrigue of the researchers, he found a ring around Jupiter and wondered if perhaps he had remote viewed the planet Saturn by mistake. But when Pioneer 10 did do the flyby, it did take place and confirmed the existence around, or actually the rings around Jupiter. Interestingly, a Pune-based medical doctor by the name of Dr. P.V. Vartek has contacted this writer and sent newspaper clippings describing his astral views of the moon, Mars, and Jupiter. And again, we have documentation that dates before these NASA Pioneer satellites went by. So, you know, one would argue, well, yeah, that was published, and so they said they saw that. But this was documented, dated, stamped, acknowledged before the NASA Pioneer 10 got to see that. And sounds like with Quite a lot of accuracy with the rings, especially. So Paul H. Smith became convinced of his abilities when he read of the May 17th, 1987 attack on the frigate USS Stark in the Washington Post. Not three days before, he had seen an attack on an American warship, including the location, the method, and the motive. The viewing session was around 30 pages long and included writing and sketching of ships, parts of ships, and map-like diagrams and more in detail. No, he, he, what he read about it in the paper three days later, he successfully had seen it in, in enough detail that, that he was considered one of the bigger successes. Well, speaking of detail, we, I have another example here that occurred in 1974, and the amount of detail that this psychic researcher shared was, to me, mind-boggling. This has to do with a radio listening post, uh, Urals of 1974. The receiver volunteered to scan the Soviet Union for a radio listening post and claimed to have found one located at latitude 65 degrees, 0 minutes, 57 seconds north, and a longitude of 59 degrees, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds east. Very, very specific. Note the astonishing precision of pinpointing the geographical coordinates. The receiver then described in detail the geographical features of the surrounding area of that site as follows. Elevation, 6,200 feet. 
scrubby brush, tundra-type ground kind of hummocks, rocks, outcroppings, mountains, fairly steep slopes, facing north for about 60 miles, ground slopes then into a marshland area. A mountain chain runs off to the right, about 35 degrees east of north. Facing south, the mountains run fairly north and south. Facing west, mountains drop down to the foothills for about 60 miles or so. Then there's rivers running roughly north. Facing east, mountains are rather abrupt, dropping to rolling hills and flatland. The area site underground has reinforced concrete, doorways of steel, the roll-up type. Usually high ratio of women to men. At least at night, I see some helipads, concrete, light rail tracks run up from pads where these helicopters would land to another set of rails that parallel doors are leading into the mountain. 30 miles north, 5 degrees west of north, on the side is a radar installation with one large, I would guess 165 foot dish and 10 small fast track dishes. The above report was verified by personnel of the sponsoring organization being substantially correct. That was some explicit details. No kidding. So my last one is probably considered one of the most successful cases in Project Stargate, and it's one that was viewed by Rosemary Smith. She was able to locate a Soviet airplane that had crashed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, then called Zaire. Rosemary was a young woman at the time, And when given a map, she marked a very specific spot where she felt that the airplane had gone down. Her mark was converted into coordinates, and those coordinates were provided to the CIA uh, station chief in Zaire. Two days later, the Soviet spy plane was found using the coordinates provided by Rosemary, exactly where she said it would be. And subsequently, the CIA was able to recover some valuable technology from the plane. Wow. So again, she pointed to a map, and they took those coordinates. Right there. X marks the spot. Yep. Well, my last story is a research center in former Soviet Union. Uh, This was in July of 1974. Now, this was the CIA's very first operational viewing assignment. The viewer, once again, was Pat Price, the one that gave us all the explicit details in my last example. Pat was asked to describe what uh, was located as a suspended underground nuclear testing site in the former Soviet Union, known by the code name of PNUTS, the letter P in UTS. CIA indicated that this is of great interest to them. They had in their possession a spy satellite photograph of the site. The viewer was given only the geographical coordinates of the site in the degrees, minutes, and seconds. This type of viewing has been referred to as coordinate remote viewing, and it was something that Pat Price kind of excelled at. Pat was also told that the site was an R&D test facility. The government's representative decided that if the viewer described either the known multi-story crane or odd structures resembling oil well derricks, then they would continue. Now, Pat's description of the remote site, in his own words, was, I'm lying on my back on the roof of two or three-storied brick buildings. It's a sunny day. The sun feels good. There's this most amazing thing. There's this gigantic crane moving back and forth over my head. As I drift up into the air and I look down, it seems to be riding on some form of a railroad track with one rail on each side of the building. I've, I've never seen anything like that. The viewing assignment continued for a couple weeks during which he drew pictures of this gigantic gantry crane and many other items on the site, such as a cluster of compressed gas cylinders in particular, which were also visible in the satellite pictures. The gantry crane was moving on eight large wheels, two on each of four legs. This unique feature was confirmed by the satellite photographs. The remarkable similarity of the drawing and the crane and the satellite photo can be seen again on Ed May's website at www.lfr.org. In later sessions, Pat described the activities in the interior of the building on top of which he had been lying on earlier. He explained, People were assembling a giant 60-foot diameter metal sphere using thick metal gores like sections of an orange peel. But the workmen were having trouble welding it all together as the pieces were warping as with the heat transferring. They were therefore looking for lower temperature welding materials. I remember hearing some of the words 
and the discussion between the scientists. SRI researchers were later told that the site was super secret Soviet atomic bomb laboratories. They also learned three years later from the news item published in an Aviation Week magazine that the sphere, which was about 58 foot in diameter, was intended to capture and store energy from a nuclear driven explosive or pulse power generators. Russell Targ has commented that the accuracy of Price's drawing is the sort of things that the physicist would never have believed if I had not seen it for myself. Eric, I predict you're going to ask me if it's time for headlines. Is it time for headlines? I got it in one. Look at that. Well, I couldn't help myself when I stumbled across this story. I almost want to say not related, but it does involve psychic abilities. From Showbiz Cheat Sheet by Emma McKee, dated February 10th, 2024. Elvis's friend said the Presley family had scary psychic abilities. Quote, it was eerie. Ooh, Elvis Presley. So one of Elvis Presley's longtime friends and bodyguards got to know the singer's family pretty well over the years. So one of Elvis' bodyguards, his last name was West. Elvis actually had two bodyguards with the last name West. One was Sonny, one was Red. They were cousins, and he'd known them for a long time. But the article just said West for some reason. But it he had worked with uh, as Elvis's bodyguard long before the singer had the needs or the means to hire more people. Now, his parents were glad for this because, according to Wes, they seemed to have a psychic ability to tell when Elvis was in trouble and wanted to make sure he was protected, that he had someone there he could trust. That's the purpose of a bodyguard. He, he even said that Elvis shared similar abilities. Now, he began working with Elvis early in his career, and he grew used to dragging Elvis out of mobs of fans or other sticky situations. But he also grew to used to Elvis's mother's seemingly psychic ability to know when her son was in danger. Quote, there was always something very eerie about the things she would say like she was psychic or something like that. Now, he said in the book, Elvis, What Happened, written by Steve Dunleavy, whenever he had a particularly wild scene on stage or if a riot broke out, whenever Elvis called her, she would somehow have some premonition that, that someone had got out of hand even before reading it in the newspaper. Wes noted that Elvis and his parents, Vernon and Gladys, all slept walked and had vivid dreams, which he believed was somehow connected to their psychic abilities. I mean, I believe all this sleepwalking and dreaming were somehow related to some kind of special powers, something like psychic powers or something I don't really understand or could put my finger on. A lot of that psychic stuff is a lot of bunk, but to some degree, I believe in it. Elvis proved it to me again and again. Wes believed Gladys had a particularly strong psychic link to her son. In 1955, West and Elvis were driving between shows when their car burst into flames. They both escaped unharmed, though, of course, shaken. Quote, the next day, Elvis made a telephone call to his mother, and what happened was scary. She had absolutely no way of knowing what had happened. It wasn't in any newspaper or anything. Nobody knew about it. Apparently, at about two in the morning, she just sat bolt upright in bed, snapped clean out of her sleep. She nudged Vernon awake and said, I see our boy. He's in a blazing car. The next morning, Gladys told her son about the frightening vision. When Elvis called that morning, she said, Oh, thank God, you're all right. I dreamed you were trapped in a blazing car. Elvis said he was all right and nothing had happened. Of course, he would never do anything to worry his mama. Now, I was there at the other end of the telephone when that conversation went on, so I know that it was true. After the telephone conversation, Elvis and I looked at each other as if someone had just walked across our graves. It was eerie. Wes grew used to Gladys Presley's protective nature. Every time th- they spoke, she told Wes to watch out for her son, and she grew more insistent about it toward the end of her life. Wes believed she wanted to make sure Elvis was safe after she was gone. Uh, his final quote, Man, that dear lady knew she was dying. She never said anything like that, but the way she was talking, it was as if it was all over. She knew she didn't have long. When I got up to say goodbye, she just sort of called me back, and she said what I had heard her say a hundred times. Bob, look after my boy. When she said it this time, it was different. There was a sort of, I don't know, a sort of finality to the sound of her voice, like it was the last time that she would ever say it to me. And it was. Wow. Well, my headline uh, deals with a gentleman, actually, I don't think we really touched upon, but also played a key part. And that was Robert Monroe. Robert Monroe was one of many, but Monroe worked very closely with the CIA and many of the early experiments with remote viewing that later, a lot of those fell under Stargate, as Bill had said. My wife stumbled across this while I was doing research. And again, Bill and I have different ways of doing research. I'm a very uh, visual person, so I like to watch a lot of 
YouTube and, and different stuff. Well, somebody had mentioned this Robert Monroe, and in particular, the Monroe Institute in Faber, Virginia. As some of you know, my, our daughter and grandchildren live in Virginia, and my wife looks over at me, and I'm not even really sure what she's talking about at this time, and she goes, you know, we're going to Virginia. I want to know what this Monroe Institute in Faber, Virginia is. It is a on, well, it can be an online class or a physical class that you can attend even today, very active, to learn the arts of remote viewing. The article that I found actually is uh, an ad directly on the Monroe Institute webpage, and it says a rare opportunity to develop your natural psychic abilities to collect information on anything, anywhere, at <laughs> any time. There is an application that's required that you got to fill out and you have to be pre-approved so they don't just take your money they want to know more about you before they take your money i mean it's a psychic school shouldn't they know if you're going to go there or not my point exactly <laughs> but they have a residential program for two thousand five hundred and ninety five dollars wow. you get to go for five days and six nights and it says here um Joe and his team, I'm assuming, I think Joe is actually a, a descendant of Robert, so I'm assuming Joe is Joe Monroe, and his team of highly skilled trainers guide you on an experimental journey into the fascinating world of remote viewing. In just six days, you'll learn to develop your natural or innate ability to perceive and describe information about a person, a place, or an object from distance. Learn new ways to clear and focus your mind so it can receive remote viewing input. You'll discover how to use sight as well as taste, smell, sound, feeling, and any other forms of perception to collect information. You'll get experience in processing and identifying the info that you access. And ultimately, you'll determine the value of that information within your own personal world construct. Use the tools and the pros. You'll be introduced to scientifically tested perpetual tools techniques used by Joe and the other professional remote viewers. You'll also hear the history, protocols, success stories, all sponsored by remote viewing, like Stargate. Focus your mind using Hemi Sync. While your success as a remote viewer is strongly tied to psychic ability, Hemi Sync audio technology aids your learning process by helping you to focus. Play the three essential roles. Successful remote viewing requires more than the remote viewer themselves. While the viewer serves as the perceiver and the illustrator, you'll also need a monitor who will function and the assistant to the viewer. And you'll need a judge or an analyst who evaluates the accuracy of the session. Just how well did you do? You'll have the chance to play all three critical roles during this highly participatory retreat. Now go beyond the boundaries of time and space. Once you master the basics, you'll participate in a series of double-blind, independently judged remote viewing trials to test your newly acquired skills. Transform your beliefs. Like most participants, you may find you shift from a remote viewer skeptic to a believer. Many past participants also reported they gained a deeper understanding of themselves, acquired new insights to perceptions and realities, and improved their problem-solving skills overall. They walked away with a greater awareness of their environment and a profound understanding that they are more than their physical bodies. Perceive the unseen. Learn new ways of clearing and focusing your mind to receive remote viewing input from one of the world's leading remote viewers. I'm sorry, this is Joe McGonigal. He is the best. He supposedly. is the best. Okay. Explore all three roles again associated with remote viewing. Perceiver, illustrator, monitor, assistant to the viewer, and the judge. Evaluator of the session. Discover why each of these three roles is critical to the success and true understanding and measurement of remote viewing. Now, again, this is something that uh, my wife, Sarah, has, has always been intrigued with. Astral projection, all of this. And honestly... She even looked into the possibilities. That's where I got this. I wonder how much that would cost. <laughs> and there's various different costs. There's, you can go for like a one-day class. There's seminars. There's stuff you can take online. But I did joke with her. I said, you know, if we could somehow manage to put her in that class, that would be an interesting podcast to come back as a <laughs> follow-up. You know, do you feel you really learned anything? Do you feel you did it good? Do you feel you did it bad? You know, what's, what's your take on it? So. Uh, 
I, I'm not saying we're going to do it, but we're going to be out there for about two months. So uh, it's not all that far of a drive from where we're going to be at. It would definitely be, be interesting. So question, Bill. First off, do you believe remote viewing is real? I would say some people have a talent. You're kind of that has a gift uh, or a curse, as it might be. Some people definitely have some sort of ability. I mean, you don't have successes where somebody, I mean, like the young lady pointing at the map. Yeah, X marks the spot. You know, you've got a whole continent there she could have pointed at. Or even, say, narrow it down to just one country. That's still an awful lot of space to point to a place and go, well, it's right there. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's not unheard of that. Some police departments and stuff work with psychics to help find, you know, missing persons and, and different things like that. I'm not saying they're always successful and obviously there's there's frauds out there, but there are a lot of those cases that kinda like the lady that marked X marks the spot. She's you know, they'll be like, It's out here at this lake on this corner, you know, about three foot under, you'll find the remains and they find it. So either this psychic is also a serial killer in some aspects and buried the body there themselves or, or, or there's something, you know, to it. Yeah. I, I'm kind of like you. I, I think, although it does seem to be contrary to what I'm about to say that all people are born with it, I, I can say I, I feel like I inadvertently have participated in it as a young child when I was probably in sleep, which may have been more of an astral projection thing. Uh, and it seemed extremely real, but then again, sometimes dreams do seem real. But whatever that was seems to have faded away as I've gotten older. But I do think, obviously, there's there's something there for some people. You may not be one of them. I may not be one of them. But I I do think there's you know there's there's something there. That's, I hate to say a second question because I'm I'm hogging all the time here, Bill. But let's just say that you and I maybe we enroll. We spent. $2,750 each. We went to this class in Virginia. We came out believers. Where is it that you might want to try to remote view? Oh, I mean, I think you you could probably re- make a list, you know, like Area 51 and, and things like that. Places that you're not supposed to know about and places you're not supposed to see. I mean, if I can go visit a place, what's the point of doing the remote viewing? I could just go there. Right. So right. it's definitely going to be. Yeah, it's not like I'm going to go to Yellowstone Park, you know. Yeah. Well, anybody can go to Yellowstone Park, but. So Area 51, would that be at the top of your list? That would definitely be up there. Okay. Mine, a little bit different. I would want to go to the depths of the ocean because you hear so many times, you know, space is the final frontier that we've discovered everything on Earth. I don't believe that. You know, the Earth's covered by, what, 60, 70 percent, whatever, of water. We, we know more about what orbits our planet than we do about the stuff in the ocean. Exactly. And to my point, you know, just now are we starting to get the technology for submarines and stuff to be able to go down into those trenches and those ungodly depths that just crush you with pressure. But if you didn't have to worry about that and you could remote view and obviously not have to worry about breathing underwater or any of that, I think it would be very interesting to go see what creatures might lurk in the murky, deep depths of the ocean. I think that would be where I would choose. What about you? What's your question? Do you think you've ever like either yourself or, or someone like, have you ever been around or been exposed to or, or in your yourself ever experienced psychic phenomena? Well, I will say the closest that I can personally relate would be our, my whole family seems to have this, my, my direct family, my wife, my kids. If one of my kids, and we'll use my daughter, Shannon, who lives in Virginia, I mean, a long distance away from Missouri, obviously. You kind of get that sick feeling in your stomach that something's not quite right. I don't know if that's kind of what along the lines, but it's close as I can say. And I don't know the details. It's not like I can project myself there and see it, but I get that just kind of, I haven't got a phone call. I don't know anything about it, but it's just like something doesn't feel right. So you, you pick up the phone, you call them or whatever. And sure enough, you know, the the dog just knocked something over and it shattered the patio glass door. You know, something that was pretty alarming. We had an incident with that. Our, our daughter actually we end, or ended up calling 911 because she was having uh, some heart issues. And both my wife and I had felt sick all day. Just not nauseous, not sick sick, but something wasn't right. And then we found out that she was, you know, she called us saying, I, I called 911. Her husband Jordan was at work, you know, and it was just like we looked at each other and it's like, is that what we were feeling? 
I guess that's the closest I could relate. How about you? I would say I've had some mildly prophetic dreams where like the one that I remember the most is from when I was very, very young. And I remember a specific person I went to school with and I wouldn't say he was a friend, just somebody I knew. But I remembered having a dream of him coming to school and, and talking about having this new Nintendo game. And then the next week, like that event unfolded the way I dreamed about it. It's almost like you wished it. Uh, I mean, I don't know why I would have wished it, but um, you know, it's just, I, I, I think I saw it ahead of time. And then I'm very, very prone to deja vu. Oh yes. And when I experienced deja vu, I would say, you know, at least a 10th of the times that I've had deja vu. The reason I feel that way is because I remember something like that from a dream. So, and I have experienced that too, you know, especially traveling like we go into a flea market or an antique and we've never been there. But I know if you go down this hallway and you hang a right, that there's going to be a, a, a Star Wars toy, an original box that I've been looking for, you know, something weird. And, and you go around the corner and you're like, is it there? Is it there? For me, I will say like the most recent one I can think of is uh, over Easter weekend, I was playing a board game that I had just bought. I'd never played it before. And one could argue it's very similar to a board game I already own. So, you know. Similar. But as I was sitting there playing that game and I was playing with my my two youngest kids and my oldest son's fiance, and it seemed like that particular setup with those people at that table with that game felt so very familiar. And I, and I could swear that I had had a dream about something like that, which is really weird in that it wouldn't have been my three kids. So in my dream, I, I believe I remember playing with my two kids and someone I didn't know. Ah. So I've had like weird, never anything important. I've never dreamed about like the lottery numbers or anything like that. But, <laughs> you know, weird little like, like I said, when I, when I experience deja vu, sometimes like I can remember a dream that's like, oh, I did dream about this. I was working on something at work, uh, my new job, which obviously is all new to me. I, you know, I just started there a few months ago. and remembered having like a very similar experience in a dream as something I was doing at that place. Now, again, this is a job I had never done before. I was new there and this dream happened before I worked there. So again, these dreams are kind of weird. They don't really have a lot of value to them. Yeah. The frightening part is, is I am prone to having nightmares. And so every now and then I may have a dream that I'm being chased by some kind of horrible monster. Or I'm in a haunted house. <laughs> and so the thing is, is that I also hope those dreams don't come true. And, and one story, I think I may have told this on the podcast. I was talking to a, a friend of mine one time, and he was someone who I had not gone to school with. I met him after I'd graduated high school. We just worked at the same place, and we got to talking. And, and one day we were talking about where I grew up there in Lakeway, and he was like, we were talking about dreams and stuff and stuff like that. And I said, well, I'd had this dream one time that I had gone to this house, and I didn't remember anything more than just like a rough outline of the house, kind of what it looked like, but that while I was in that house, there was a, a girl there and this young girl had been accidentally shot and killed by her brother at, when I was in school. She was in my class. And so I remember going to that house and her being there and she was the only person there. And for some reason she was very upset and I was trying to help her. And he said, well, had you ever been to her house? He said, no. And he goes, okay, that's really weird. He said, because my girlfriend from high school, which he went to an entirely different school, different town, had gone to a house in the town I grew up in that was allegedly haunted because a young girl had been shot and killed by her brother in that house. Oh, wow. The house I described was the house he went to. That's what he said. So That's freaking bizarre. That was kind of kind of strange. Well, I will say this in my most creepy stalker voice as we close. First, thanks for listening. But two, when you pull the curtains and you lower the blinds, just wonder, is someone still watching you? <laughs> How? It makes me want to sing that. I always feel like somebody's, somebody's watching me and I got no privacy. <laughs> Thanks for listening, y'all. We appreciate each and every one of you. Hey, real quick, call to action. I think Eric would agree. We'd like to grow this. Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Absolutely. If you could, if you're listening on Apple, if you would go and give us a review and, and rate us. Uh, if you have some feedback, that's fine, too. Uh, whatever whatever platform you're listening, follow us, rate us, give us some reviews. That helps get some recognition and gets our name out there. We do have a Facebook page, Nightmares on the Lost Highway. You can easily find us if you want to communicate with us. If you want to share some uh, 
possibilities for future podcasts with us, you know, reach out. We want to talk with you guys. You said obelisks. Do you mean obelisks? It's the same thing. I've never heard of obelisks. I, I have. Okay. You want me to fix it? Are you being picky? Well, I, I, that, I was like, oh, obelisks. Okay. Maybe it's just a term I've never. It's just the way I. Really well, that's just the way I, I. That's the way I've always said it. Huh. Okay. I'm not. I'm just... <laughs> I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, (laughs) using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing. And thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. And I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love. But we're we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much.